Today we uh, continue a conversation. Um, we started last week, and during Christmas, often it starts to feel like just the same old thing uh, that you unpack. And this year, I don't know why, but it just kind of stuck out of this story that maybe you and I, we've heard before. It's a story of uh, the three wise men, these travelers from a distant country that travel to come to the child Jesus, and what they do is they bring three gifts. And that's why they get the name, the three wise men. Likely it was a large caravan of people from a distant country. And uh, they bring gold, which we talked about last week, this value that they recognize Jesus as valuable, that he has authority. But then the, the next gift is one called frankincense. And studying frankincense, frankincense and thunder have a lot in common. Thunder and lightning, maybe you have kids or dogs and you know that they, they get scared of it, right? It has a, a shock to it. it. It's scary when it's close to you. Uh, for many of us, we, we recognize the power of thunder. In the Bible, it's explained often almost like a connection with God. Thunder, his voice thunders, that, that God has this like thunderous power, that this is throughout scripture almost a reference of who God is, that he has this type of uh, 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 strength and recognition when he speaks and what he does. With, with thunder and lightning, like uh, I, I was uh, brought to this word thunderstruck. For some of you, that immediately took you back to a band that was like dun, thunder. Dun, dun. But that word thunderstruck, the definition is this it's extremely surprised or shocked. This, this, this surprise or shock fill. This, is, this happens in life, right, in different ways. When I was thinking about this, I thought about my, my wife had a birthday recently, and when we celebrated it, we had a few close friends, and we went down to Mexico to a restaurant that we loved down there. We stayed down there for a few days, and uh, I remember as we were getting ready, um, I have an electric shaver, so I was going to get clean and try to look presentable for my wife's birthday to make her happy, and, uh, and then immediately what happened is that was dead, so I needed to charge it, and somehow, I don't know why engineers have not figured this out yet, but when you charge an electric char uh, shaver, you should still be able to use it. Like, it doesn't seem that hard to do, but it doesn't work, so now you have to wait. But the only plug that I could find was on my wife's side, so I, I go over to that side, um, which she doesn't like because then she knows that I'm too lazy to go back to my side when it's charged, so then I shave on her side, which means it's a mess everywhere, and she's got to figure that out. Um, but I don't like it either because when I'm over there, there's this mirror that she has, and that mirror, like, it's too true. It's zoomed in. It tells you every problem with your face. I don't like it. It's, it's, it, it's too honest, right? I, I, want, I want the skinny mirror. I want the one that maybe makes me look buff up top. Like, I don't know if that's a thing, but I want that one. And hers tells me too much what I really look like. And, which is kind of like actually what you and I, we need. We don't like it, but we need it. It's even the church. It's supposed to be a place where we uh, are, are encouraged by each other, but also where we're called out, where we're in authentic relationships because I know that I still have room to improve, but that's another point in itself. We finally get ready. We go to this beautiful restaurant. It's right on the water. Waves are crashing into the side of it. You're sitting there. If you sit too close, you get wet. So we sit a little further away, but we enjoy this meal and we celebrate. And sneaky, I, I lean over to the server at one point and I let him know it's my wife's birthday he's like I got you and the next thing he surprises he shocks her he brings a sombrero he puts it on her head a whole crew of them come they start uh, they, they, they bring a plate of dessert it's beautiful and then they start singing estas son las mañanitas que cantar en David that's the only part I know but hey you gotta give me a little credit here but I only know that part but then they, they continue singing, but now they speed it up. And they're like, they got energy. There's a whole crew of them. And then again, we're shocked and surprised when they hand her these two rods that she holds on to. And then they have a little box connected to it. And they turn it. And they're like, all throw, all throw. And they turn it. And they're all throw. And they keep on turning it. And she doesn't notice at first, but over time, she starts feeling a tingle. And then it gets a little more, a little more. And they shock her. And then she finally goes, I can't do anymore. And then they do it to all of us at the table. Why? I have no idea. <laughs> None of it makes sense. But it's this amazing like, reminder. It brings us back to this memory. It's all of this kind of, if you just stop and oh, we're so busy in life that if we just pause and we, 
we see all these moments the beautiful scenery, the, the strength of God with even just waves hitting the side. It's the surprise even of just a birthday and a song, whatever it might be. And I say all that to say there's a point in which this section of scripture that we look at has that same kind of recognition. We just have to do the work to discover it. It's the same, it's Matthew chapter uh, two, verse nine. I just wanna read this. I read this last week. I'll read it again just to kind of set the setting. Uh, But it says this, it says, after this interview, the wise men went their way. Now first, just so we understand what's happening, the wise men from a distant country, they would travel to meet Jesus. And as you would do, especially when you're rulers in a different country, you would first go to the ruler in that country and let them know, hey, we're here for a reason. We don't wanna cause any problems. We're just going on a peaceful journey. So he does that. There's this interview interrogation, and then they're on their way. And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasure chest and gave him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Frankincense, it's interesting. It's, a, it's like a, a branch, a leaf, uh, and it's used throughout history. It was used for health benefits. Um, frankincense is still used today. It's a uh, essential oil. Someone in here just perked up. There's a Karen in the room that was just like, huh? <laughs> and if you're offended, you could use an essential oil to calm yourself down. <laughs> okay, but there is true, like uh, this frankincense, it has value. It has value, it, it's, um, it, it has been treated for the immune system, uh, inflammation. It is even found in studies that it helps in aiding the fight against cancer. It's for skin, it fights acne, sunspots, cellulite, all this kind of stuff, it has helped over the process. So frankincense has value. It has been at some points recognized as just as valuable as gold at times in history. Frankincense, it has this type of value. Uh, they would recognize this, but when, when the people that heard this story for the first time, the, the nation of Israel, God's people, when they first heard this, they would connect it to something else as well. See, in their temples, in their churches, for their service, their worship service, they would have uh, incense burning of frankincense. So when they saw it, they heard this. These travelers from afar come and they bring gold, but they bring worship they bring frankincense so when they see this they know one of the values that they are bringing in this moment they bring worship to god here's the interesting thing for many of us worship kind of gets misunderstood over the course of time right when i mean it's a form of it but we say let's worship together what do we mean often we're saying we're going to sing some songs that is a form of worship, but if you go throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, there's form of singing and praise, there's forms of bringing an offering, there's forms of uh, a, a life of obedience to God. It's all of this stuff that co- falls the, under the umbrella of worship. What is worship? Throughout the, uh, the Bible, throughout the New Testament alone, there's famous stories of worship. You have Paul and Silas, they're sharing the gospel, they get arrested for that, they're put in a prison cell, and the next thing we're told is that in that prison cell, they begin to worship. The whole prison is filled with like awe of that, and others also follow in that leadership. There's a famous story, a woman with an alabaster jar. We looked at that a few weeks ago where there's this lady that shows up at a dinner uh, that she was not invited to. She's characterized as an immoral person. Uh, She would likely have, uh, her whole career would be of means that are uh, are frowned upon and not approved of. Every dollar that she has would be from those means. She would purchase an alabaster jar, go to the feet of Jesus, sit there, and she would wash his feet, wipe them with their hair, this response of worship to Jesus in that moment. There's a a widow, Jesus points out, this widow, it's known as the widow's mite, she would uh, bring the minimal money she had because back then uh, there was no system to support you, her husband has passed away, she has no financial resources, just minimal income left, and she would go to the offering at the church and she would give her money to God. 
Jesus says that woman truly worships because of that response. There's a story in John chapter 12. That one I want us to look at. John chapter 12, verse 1, if you can. It's an anointing of Jesus in a city called Bethany. John chapter 12, verse 1. It says this. It says, Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus. The man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared In Jesus' honor, Martha served as Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume, made uh, made from essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance, but Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replies to this. And he says, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial, who will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. It's this famous story of a woman responding in worship but here's the thing, you, you can't fully understand what's happening. For some of us, we might ask the question, what we're told is that that perfume was a year's wages. Imagine that for a moment. Just think of like a, roughly the income you make in a year. And imagine you buy perfume. First of all, that is a horrible way to uh, save money. But you, you buy a, a, a thing of perfume and then you go to the feet of Jesus and you were to pour out every drop and worship him in that manner. That kind of response. For some of us adults, we wonder a lot of things, but we never ask. For kids, often they'll ask the hard questions because they're not afraid that that is a que- it doesn't make sense. For some of us, we could look at that and go, is Jesus really needing that? Couldn't that be used in a better way, right? Even Judas says that. He doesn't mean it, but he says it is, you could have used that to help the poor, the needy. For some of us, we could say the same thing. You could use that, whatever that is, in a different way. But if, if you were to talk to her likely, she would give her reasoning for why she responded in the way she did. And the same might be true for a time of worship like right now when we respond in worship, where, where maybe you were standing as we were singing songs and you look around and you see, see some people lifting of hands, you see some people singing out, you see some people emotional, and you might wonder why, and the truth is you would have to ask them. Because they would likely tell you it's because of the memory and the scenes that they have seen of God's faithfulness in their life, of the areas in which they have just barely gotten through, their marriages were on the brink of disaster and they saw God reconcile something that they never thought possible. It was in moments where they, they continued to trust God and be faithful to God and they continued to question but they have seen over the course of time God's faithfulness. It is moments like this. It might be a time where someone is surrendering something over to God and saying, God, God, I'm no longer going to hold on control. I trust you. We can't always understand. It's the interesting thing about worship. It's very communal. It's very corporate, but it's very personal also. What happens within us, it can't be forced. I cannot force you to worship God. It has to happen within you. It's a response that comes out. It's a reminder of God's faithfulness throughout your life and The interesting thing, though, about this is you can't fully understand this John chapter 12 unless you understand John chapter 11. This is kind of the problem with sometimes when you read the Bible, if you uh, get the verse of the day. I'm not saying that's wrong or anything, but sometimes you you don't fully understand everything if you're not looking at the full context, the verses before it, the verses after it, what is the setting, what's occurring. John chapter 12 makes a lot more sense when you see John chapter 11. John chapter 11 shares this famous story. It's a story of Jesus, uh, he, he's surrounded by a crowd and a few people come up to him and say, hey, Jesus, your friend Lazarus is sick. What they mean by this is it is getting bad. He's on, if you will, he's on hospice. It's that bad. Jesus says, okay, I'm gonna come visit, but not yet. And then some days pass. 
what we're told is Jesus finally says, okay, it's time for us to go visit Lazarus. When he gets there, the family says it's too late. Lazarus is dead. He's been dead for three days. Jesus says, take me to where he is. They go to this tomb, if you will. It would be a place where you would bury the dead. It would be a place where, uh, in their tradition, they would cover uh, the, the person with this uh, dead cloth, if you will. It's uh, uh, this sacri- Okay, so it's this setting, and Jesus walks up to this, and he says, open the tomb, and then he, he, he yells into it, and he says, Lazarus, come out. The whole family's there. They're watching. They gotta be confused, Right? Then they start to hear movement. Then they see a little movement inside in a silhouette. And this figure comes out. Jesus says, Lazarus, take off your dead clothes. He will do this. And the family will see their son, their brother, their friend alive again. It's all a a, a prophetic moment. Jesus is pointing to that. that What happened with Lazarus is a small picture of what will happen with me. And I will come and I will uh, take on the sin of the world and I will uh, be resurrected and all this. So it's a, a, a prophetic moment, but it's pointing to something. But it's in this moment that that sisters would see their brother alive again. Why does that make so much? It is when you look at John chapter 12 and you begin to see uh, the setting where we're told Six days before the Passover, uh, Jesus arrived in a a town called Bethany, the home of Lazarus. He's in this place. We're we're told even more that Jesus is sitting at the dinner table with Lazarus. This man is here. Now what we also are told is that Martha and Mary, these are the sisters of Lazarus. Martha is in the kitchen getting things ready and Mary, that would normally, there's a whole nother story to it as well. That would normally be where she should be and Martha kind of gets mad because Mary's not in there with her helping. Why? Because Mary is at the feet of Jesus with this expensive perfume. See, it, you don't understand someone's response until you understand what happened before it. So you, you, you begin to maybe understand John chapter 12 a little more when you understand what Mary just witnessed in John chapter 11. So why did she respond in this way? B- because she has just seen the most amazing thing. This is the Messiah here in this place right now and her only response can be that he is worthy of my worship no matter what that looks like. She has seen the Messiah, hear her cries, walk through her deepest valleys. She has seen the Messiah give her strength, give her power in these moments of struggle. For many of us, it's the same response. Why do we worship God? It's because we have seen God's faithfulness throughout our lives in the darkest times when we have trusted him. Our our worship is because he's worthy of it. We respond in that way because we have seen his faithfulness. This is... This is the setting, but here's the, here's the problem is worship is not just a playlist. It's not just a, a set of songs. Throughout scripture, we see it in different ways. It's a lifestyle. It's an act of obedience. It's the words that we say. We're told that worship is also bringing our offering to God. It's all of these areas in which worship is almost categorized within it. And the truth is we all worship something. Philosophers have this uh, debate, and now really they've come to this conclusion that uh, none of us are really free. What they mean by that is there's this idea of negative freedom. It's this like there's no obstacle at your like that you face ever at all. But then there's the idea of positive freedom. It's that you have the freedom to choose, but within confines of society, of maybe God, of what it might be. Like I have the power to choose what is good now because of him in the same way it's our worship you you will worship something you have to choose what you worship for some of us we worship ourselves, our possessions our sexuality our secularism our uh, uh, our ideology like whatever it might be we we worship something all the time or for some of us it might be a decision that no I choose if you will to step away from those things because there's something more worthy of my worship the creator of the universe but you worship something but it becomes more interesting when you see really what worship speaks about. The first time worship is really referenced in the Bible, it's a story, a story that many of us probably have heard before. It's a man named Abraham and his son Isaac. 
Abraham is instructed by God. They've been praying for a child. They finally have a child. He becomes like a teenager at this point. And uh, that man, there are just so like, man, how amazing is God? He provided when we were so concerned that we won't leave a legacy of generations to come. And God finally gave it. And then one day God speaks to Abraham and says, I want you to go sacrifice your son Isaac on an altar. Like, for many of us, we're like, why would God ever do that? Now, you follow that story more, and there's this moment where Abraham gets everything ready, probably reluctantly, but he knows, I've seen God be faithful before, and I have to trust him again as much as it hurts. And he, he will take his son Isaac, and he will have one servant with him helping carry all of the preparations for this sacrifice. And they begin the journey. They get to the bottom of this mountain, and uh, Abraham speaks to the servant. And he says, stay here. My son and I are going to go worship. Worship, that word, worship. He didn't go up there and sing a set of songs. He, he went up there in obedience to God. Our worship is sometimes just being obedient to who God created us to be, to living that out. Sometimes it's, it's worship when we just act out in faith to what God has spoken to us, what he says in his word for our lives. Sometimes it's realizing that our worship is leaving a legacy for the next generations to come. You know, this church, it was, uh, we're almost at 80 years of this church existing. Yeah, 80 years. Some of you are that old. Some of us are not. 80 years, though. Can I tell you, there were a group of people almost 80 years ago that said, you know what, what if we planted a church? What if we invested our time, our resources, our money to start this church in this community that it would share the gospel out into the city and that it would make disciples inside the walls? And over the course of 80 years, they would begin the work with a vision to leave a legacy for another generation and another generation this is kind of the picture of what our worship is supposed to look like. Some of us, as we, the problem is we can even look at horrible, sad stories where you see leaders and, and, and pastors and other people step out in faith and do good things, but over the course of time, they never end well. What has happened in that span of time? Something has happened where sometimes, and I, I think maybe this is even a connection to that childlike faith, where sometimes as we get older, we stop having faith in God like we once did. And we get to a place where we start holding on to resources instead of trusting God with our resources. Saying, I wanna reach a city, oh, but never mind, I need to have more savings. And we get to a place where we stop actually worshiping God in obedience, in faith, to leave a legacy for the generations to come, for our kids, for their grandkids, for their grandkids, and in turn, we start holding on to things. And I think at that point, Point, we stop worshiping God and we start worshiping ourselves. It's a picture of, of what our lives are meant to look like. And that giving is a picture as well. Throughout scripture, we're told that, that 10%, we're told uh, people came and they gave uh, uh, in a communal, like they gave all the resources and kind of banded together all this and all of it is connected to this response of worship. And I, I want you to hear me at first. Like for some of you, when you hear giving in the church, you kind of cringe a little for, for good reason sometimes because someone's out there asking for a private plane for them. Like that is, that is not a healthy way to go about it, right? There are people with really nice shoes. These are not really nice shoes. Don't judge me. There are people with uh, really nice things and they're, they're saying you need to give more to God, but it looks like that it's always benefiting them and it gets to a place where we start to go, man, the church just wants my money and I get that. And I want you to hear me. That is why we've intentionally, over the course of decades now, have chosen to do things slightly different. Amen. We do believe in, in giving to the church. That is the only way that any of this is possible is because of the generosity of people that you're sitting right next to. But the way that we give often is in some wooden boxes in the back because that is also a very private and uh, a thing, personal thing that you are doing with God. And we want you to have that response with God. Throughout the Old Testament, there's this idea of a tithe, the 10%. In the New Testament, Jesus speaks about it, and he, he speaks to the religious people, because remember, the Old Testament, a lot of it is a picture of, hey, if you want to actually live up and like earn your own salvation, here are all the rules you have to perform. Humanity could never do it. God was showing us that we needed someone else to solve that sin issue. 
So even in this, Jesus speaks to these religious people who act as if they are living up to all of their goodness in themselves. And he says, I see that you give a tithe, but you never actually help the widow or the poor. He says, don't neglect the the former without caring for the latter. What he's saying is this is a full picture of of worship and response to Jesus is, uh, yes, to care for your local church and understand the value. Jesus calls the local church his bride, that this is where people are discipled, that this is where the church can, as a larger unit, we can all reach more people with the gospel, all that. But at the end of the day, if you are not caring about your neighbor, your coworker, your friend, then you are missing it. And he points to all this. And in the, in the uh, Corinthians, Paul writes and he explains as he's talking about giving. And he says, hey, I tell you this not as a command, but as a call. A call to be more like Christ. We're called Christians for a reason. That is our pursuit, that we want to be more like Christ. We want to follow after him as much as possible because we know the way he lived was perfect. Christ would leave the riches of heaven to come down to earth for us. This is the call, this is our action. The interesting thing about that John chapter 12 story is it, it even says in the scripture, it says that uh, as Mary was worshiping Jesus in this way with that perfume, the whole house filled with that fragrance. Scientifically, it's even interesting that smell and memory are like very connected, close in the brain with like neurons or whatever those things are called, and like. We all know that kind of because there have been times where you've smelled something and it brought you back to like a memory that you had, right? It brought you back to childhood, brought you back to that experience you had with your parents, whatever it might be, but smell and memory are so connected. I think that's even important in our worship that we we even realize that memory has a big part. For me, it's, responding in worship becomes far more realistic or normal when I go back in just time and look at God's faithfulness over the course of my life. Course of my life where my wife and I would trust God with the minimal finances that we had. And then we continue to see his faithfulness in those times where we can't even always understand how he provided, but he always did. It was times in my life where, where I can stand here and just Man, respond as I hear the words that we're declaring as a church, but those words are piercing my heart because it's a recognition that Christ somehow knows me and cares about me. Why me? But he says, no, I choose you and I've reconciled you and it is all because of the grace of Christ and all you have to do is recognize it. It's moments in my life where I can see my wife, my family, we move across the country and we realize that the home that we are gonna have is no longer available and now it's like we're driving to nowhere. Where are we going? And all of a sudden, everything falls into place as we're sitting in the church that we will do ministry for five years and all of a sudden, this home that's actually better than the one we first were going to is now open for us. And it's like, man, God has provided again. It's moments in life where you see God's provision, God's faithfulness, and what does that do? That is so easy for us to to then respond in worship because we recognize his hand, he's got it, he's in control of it. Just for a moment maybe, just bow your head, close your eyes. As you do that, may, maybe what is happening is God is revealing in you something to remember his faithfulness in your life, what God has done in your life. As you sit there, I I believe there's someone here today that I want you to hear this. I don't want anything from you. I want something for you. And that maybe right now is the time where you are recognizing Jesus, not just as a historical figure, but as your Lord and Savior. With everyone with their eyes closed, if that's you that's ready to recognize Jesus as your Savior, to have a personal relationship with him, my encouragement to you is just to lift up your hand to recognize Jesus, amen, amen. Jesus makes it very clear for us on how this relationship starts. And as a whole community, as a church, I wanna encourage you, we all say this together with our eyes closed. We just repeat this prayer. Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, I recognize you as my Lord and my Savior. Give me the strength to follow you. 
that my life will be a life of obedience. And it will all declare your glory. It is because of your amazing grace that we lift our voice in praise. It is the name of Jesus that we say.